The reason why we have problems with wasps during the summer is because they don't have any food. So they're looking for anything they can possibly get, and that includes your picnic. It also includes things like your garbage can, your dog food, your cat food, anything that they can get a hold of that seems remotely like a consumable to them. Welcome to Viewscapes, stories from Washington State Magazine, connecting you to Washington State University, the state, and the world. Hi, I'm Larry Clark, editor of the magazine. In this episode, we'll talk music with composer and musician Greg Gasinitsky, take wing with wasp researcher Megan Ash, and enjoy a bowl of cherries with executive chef Jamie Callison. I mean, the easiest way to describe this, um, my mother used to ask me, you know, she said, how do you compose anyway? I mean, what do you do? And I said, well, there's like, there's a, there's a band in my head and it's playing and I write down what they're playing. <laughs> and she said, you hear a band in your head? I said, yeah. <laughs> and she said, do you hear voices too? <laughs> you know. so, That's Greg Yazaninsky. He's known to his colleagues and students as Yaz, rhymes with jazz. Yaz is a saxophonist, composer, and professor at Washington State University. I'm Brian Clark, writer at Washington State Magazine, and I talked recently with Yaz about writing and performing music. Yaz has written tons of scores for professional soloists, ensembles, bands, and orchestras. But he also writes for students, and, as we'll hear, that requires some special thought. One thing all of his compositions have in common is that, even with computers, Everything is written basically by hand, and all those parts have to line up just so. I mean, I view music as an art, obviously, but it's also a craft, and the craft part of it fascinates me. Yeah. I mean, to make sure, you've got all those parts for this, maybe you've got a 50-piece symphony orchestra, that the accent on beat one in bar 14 is the same in every one of those parts, Yeah. and that there's not one of them that's mistransposed or you didn't leave an eighth rest out of one bar. Some, You know, I mean, that is time-consuming. It's very meticulous, busy, detail-oriented yeah. kind of stuff. Take writing for students, for kids just learning to play an instrument. So we've been talking about this. When you write for the trombone section, there's certain notes you have to leave out. Why? Because the kids can't reach that far. Sure. Right? So they, they push out the slide, they can only go to here. Yeah. So those other notes that are down there, they can't play yeah. those, right? <laughs> you can write them, they won't be but able to play them. But they just are not physically... Able to do it. It's just exactly. their arms aren't long right. enough. That's so, a, you know, it's the same I, thing if you're writing a piece for young pianists, their hands are only so big. Yeah. Right? So you can't have chords with big stretches. There's all this, you know, that's all the sort of practical aspect to it. Yeah. And the crazy thing is, a middle C isn't a middle C on every instrument. I mean, it is, but, well, it just isn't. For some reason to do with the way instruments used to be made, a C as in cat on a piano is a D as in dog on a tenor sax. Go figure. Anyway, transposing for different instruments is a pain, but an essential detail that must be kept track of. If you have an E-flat, that's a good example. You have to write a C for the alto saxophone. Yeah. Or you won't get an E flat. Well, that's a little, that's kind of goofy. I mean, why would you have to do that? That's a big question. That, that, why, why is there any transposition at all? It's a Rubik's Cube to get it all to work. It, it sounds like. It's just complicated. Yeah. But it's fun. It's also really fun to play music in an ensemble live. Just listen to these guys. And I can totally relate to this because I've played music live, and boy, have I missed plenty of notes. There's an element of danger, you know, <laughs> I think, which is what makes makes listening to live music exciting. Yeah. You know, when it gets, it gets above a certain point, no matter who the trumpet player is, no matter how famous they are, no matter how great they are, 
they're probably going to miss those notes sometimes. Yeah. I don't, you know, yeah. maybe that's the thing that separates them, that they rarely miss them. But on Yaz's instrument, the tenor sax. If I press this note and blow, I'm going to get a certain note. If or like on the piano, if I press, press that key down, I'm going to get that note. Mm -hmm. That's less certain for brass players, which makes it fun for them to play, makes it exciting for us to hear. Now here's Yaz in WSU's digital recording studio overdubbing a solo for his newest album of big band jazz. <laughs> are out. And that has us wondering, what's the difference between yellow jackets, hornets, and paper wasps? And what are they doing crashing your barbecue? Yeah, that's a really good question. So here in eastern Washington, we have two species of paper wasp, and those are Plissy dominula, the European paper wasp. I'm Rachel Weber, a writer at Washington State University. That's so, Megan Ash, so a PhD student in entomology. We talked to her about the lives of wasps and her research to help humans and wasps live more harmoniously. We also have Polices orifer, which is our native species, which looks really, really similar. These two species share something in common. They fly with their landing gear down. And when you look at a paper wasp, their bodies are somewhat narrow, almost delicate. And when they fly, their little back legs are dangling. It kind of looks like kind of a lazy flight, like kind of slow, kind of like meandering. The female wasps have such delicate waists, they can really only eat nectar or crushed up bugs. Babies actually have little chewing little mouth parts. They can actually eat whole insects. So when you see a wasp fly off of the whole bug, or maybe some barbecue chicken, she's taking it to a baby that will eat that so it can get big and become an adult. And at the end of summer, wasp populations are at their peak. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of mouths to feed. At that period of time, especially here in eastern Washington, we have almost no flowers blooming. So all those little tiny insects that they would be feeding their babies, they don't have any food. And since they don't have any food, there isn't any tiny insects around. So they're looking for anything they can possibly get, and that includes your picnic. It also includes things like your garbage can, your dog food, your cat food, anything that they can get a hold of. While paper wasps are the ones you'll usually see in summer, there are also other members of the Vespidae family out and about. When you see a yellow jacket, yellow jackets are kind of short and thick, and they fly very quickly. Or hornets are considered kind of like, their, their body type is very similar to a yellow jacket, but they're larger. And for a twist, bald-faced hornets in Washington state are usually black and white wasps. There were no true hornets in Washington until the giant Asian hornet showed up late last year. Whether it's a paper wasp, hornet, or yellow jacket, all of these wasps have something in common. And it's part of the reason that Megan is so curious about them. Yeah, so really the difference between paper wasps and yellow jackets and hornets, they're all in the same um, insect family group, which is Vespidae, but they're in separate genuses. So they're just in subcategories. And they're all social, so they all have queens, they all have workers, and they produce males seasonally. Yes, even the hornets that decapitate honeybee heads have a social structure, an answer to a queen. It is the social aspect of paper wasps that motivates Ash to spend her days caring for them in her research lab at WSU Pullman. So I think a lot of people would think that it's kind of like a nature documentary you might see about ants where they're always like raiding each other and they're killing each other and they're always very warlike, or at least that's how it's always depicted on video. The wasps totally chill. Like they... They cuddle, they eat together, they they do a little bit of like dominant stuff where like maybe the like the big the big wasp in the cage is like, oh, I'm more important than you, I take your food. But it's not violent. Like they, they don't kill each other or hurt each other in any way. The project she's currently working on is funded by the Department of Defense. The end goal develop scent traps that will deter wasps from air traffic control towers. The time of the year when the wasps are trying to reproduce. So the nests have created new queens and they've created males and they're trying to find each other so they can mate, these wasps are attracted to tall structures. So the tallest building, the tallest tree, the tallest whatever in an area, the wasps will go there to congregate. And in the case of an Air Force base, 
the tallest tr structure is an air control tower. So they become pest insects at Air Force bases. Ash is working on a few new ideas to help manage the wasps at air control towers. Are there new and unique ways of trapping specifically paper wasps that would work better than something like a cylindrical trap? And something that would be more targeted than just spraying them with pesticides. So what we're looking to do is figure out how quickly can these animals learn? If I expose the wasps for a very, very short period of time, only 24 hours, to a unique odor that they've never experienced before, but have them associate it with their food, can I then make them attracted to that odor? So could we potentially set up a baiting station where they're going to a place, getting snacks, and then we turn it into a trap that catches them? While better traps may help people better coexist with wasps, Ash said that generally wasps are pretty docile creatures. On all the trips I've been on so far, I have never been stung. I wear protective clothing. I wear the bee jacket and the gloves and long pants and work boots. However, a lot of that has to do with the fact that they're really kind of scaredy cats. Perhaps wasps and human beings have a bit in common after all. We want to eat, take care of the kids, socialize, and go about our day without any trouble. Oh, and the next time you run into a wasp and you aren't sure if it's Washington's most common paper wasp or a yellow jacket, just take a look at its antennae. Yellow jackets have black antenna and the paper wasps have yellow antenna. That is, if you're fast enough to catch a glimpse before they take off. Megan Ash is also an avid insect photographer and editor of American Entomology's publication, Through the Loop. You can get a closer look at some of her work at magazine.wsu.edu. Rainier cherries are named for Mount Rainier, and one could make the case that both are splendid symbols of the state of Washington. Rainier cherries are particularly special to WSU. They were developed at the university's research station in Prosser in 1952. A USDA breeder had been looking to create a new Bing variety that would help extend the cherry season. He crossbred Bings with Van cherries that carried a recessive gene. The result was yellow-hued fruit with a pink to red blush. The appeal of those contrasting colors is just one of the reasons people pay a premium for Rainier cherries. I'm Adriana Janovich, Associate Editor at Washington State Magazine. And I'm here with Jamie Callison, Executive Chef at the Washington State University School of Hospitality Business Management. Jamie, how would you describe their flavor and their texture? I think the Rainier cherry is unique because it has a um it's sweet, but it doesn't. It's not overly sweet. The sweetness isn't isn't overpowering, and I like that about a cherry. Where some of you know you get in some of the bean cherries, and it's it's kind of a punch in the face, which I love bean cherries. Um, so I really like it. And I like using it with multiple different other cherries too, because it, it kind of balances them out. So I've read the best way to enjoy them is raw. Does it matter to you if they are raw or cooked? It does. So the rainer cherry changes color pretty dramatically when you cook it, and also um, when you freeze it too. So you know we love to buy cherries and, and freeze them um, for the seat for so we can use them all year round and use local cherries. And the the rainers have a tendency to turn brown. Um, so sometimes we will cook some in a sauce. Um, it kind of gives it gives you get the rainer flavor, and then we'll strain out that sauce. But that sauce is usually also cooked with um, bean cherries and pie cherries, a combination. Um, because the rainier cherries by themselves in the sauce with the, the color, or anytime you cook them, they kind of get an off brown color. So I think more. And so we'll, if we make a, a fruit compote, we'll actually fold in raw rainier cherries at the end. And it kind of gives it the, the great texture, the crunch, and then it also gives it the, the beautiful color of the rainier. Besides the compote, how else do you like to? Um, prepare them or serve them? Well, I love like a, um, a fresh cherry salad for like duck is really good. You know, if you get you get a little acidity in there too. So game is really good. I've, I've done that with venison. Did like a cherry compote with venison is absolutely amazing. Um, pork would be really good too. I and mean, uh, you can use a little um, Madeira or something in there. Or even pork would be really good to make a, a nice. So it could be a sauce for some, some sort of protein that has a lot of um, any kind of gamey protein uh, would be really good. I don't know, lamb I probably wouldn't use it for. There's just something about the, the texture and the flavor of lamb. I don't think it would go well. But game and, and pork, and it would be really nice as a, as a compote on there. But, again, just a fresh salad. Uh, you know, just a, it could be, you could put them in a, in a mixed green salad, too. would be really good. Um, 
with some almonds or, of course, hazelnuts from the Pacific Northwest. Uh, so there's a lot of different uh, ways to use them. What greens would you use in a salad like that? I was thinking spinach, but maybe something spinach else. Spinach would be good. Maybe even like um, arugula that wasn't overly harsh would be really good. And maybe a combination of spinach and arugula. I like using arugula a lot of times. Of course, I love arugula. I absolutely love it. But a lot of times it's it's really pep. It's almost too peppery. So um, using that with mixed greens and and other lettuces kind of combined, especially right now, go to the farmer's market. And, you know, this time of year, go to the farmer's market, there's so many different kind of greens. If you can do a blend of all these local greens together, it's amazing. That was Adriana Janovich and Chef Jamie Callison talking about the glories of Rainier cherries here on Viewscapes, a monthly podcast from Washington State Magazine. Our theme music was written by Greg Yasinitsky. For more WSU stories, videos, and photos, visit magazine.wsu.edu.